Hello everyone, and welcome to another episode of Dispelling Anti-Mormon Lies, Myths and Rumors. My name is Jeremy Goff, and today I'm going to be tackling the topic of Nephi killing Laban, and addressing how this is 100% within not only historical context, but it's within the commandments, and how there really should be no issue for anyone who is honest with themselves with this commandment of God to kill Laban. Before I get jumping in, it's always fun to see where people are watching from, so if you want to go ahead and post where you're watching from, it's fun and exciting to see people from all over the world who chime in and to see these things. And also, if you have a requested topic you'd like me to address in the future, feel free to either direct message me or to go ahead and post it in the comments below. Next week, I'm going to be addressing Revelation and specifically how God will give answers to people's prayers to bring them closer to Him, including why some people get answers that they should join other churches to come closer to him. And that's going to be next week's topic. I always look forward to addressing topics that people have that actually matter to them. This week's topic is one that I felt I should address in Sunday school. Now, in Sunday school, we were talking about the prodigal son. And we were talking about what he did when he asked his father for his property. And it was interesting because I thought it was a little bit more common knowledge, but apparently it's not quite as much, that in Jewish culture, the act of asking for your inheritance and taking that property away from your dad is considered a capital offense. It is equal to saying, I wish you were dead. And if you take it, it's equal to saying, I physically have killed you, which is why the prodigal son went off to a far country. He had to get outside of the realms of the Mosaic law, otherwise his brother or his father would have had the right to kill him. Which also then leads to explain why his father was waiting and why his father, when he saw him far away off, came running up to him, embraced him, kissed him, and said, put on the ring, put on the robe, this is my son. He was once dead, but now he's alive. Through his actions, he committed a capital offense worthy of death. And through the father's pardon, he was now pardoned. Now, it's important to understand that cultural aspect because that is through the law of Moses that the property somebody has is their livelihood. To steal it is a capital offense worthy of death. Now, the other thing to understand is that in the Ten Commandments, we read the English translation, thou shalt not kill, as commandment number six. That is not what the Ten Commandments mean to the Jews. To the Jewish people, thou shalt not kill is actually more correctly translated, thou shalt not murder. And the difference between killing and murder is very important. To kill means to kill anyone, to, sh to shed blood. To murder means to shed innocent blood. It is to take someone's life without just cause. Now, once you understand that, all of a sudden you start having a whole lot less issues with a lot of things. Like when there is a war and you are drafted as a soldier and you're fighting in a war, you are engaged in a war. And you're not murdering people, you're killing them. And there's a big difference there. But that's not even the point that I'm going to go over today. The point I'm going to go over is what Laban did and how what he did constituted not just one, but two capital offenses against Lehi and Lehi's entire family and how Nephi was 100% justified within the law to execute Laban. So first off, when Nephi goes to cover the brass plates, the very first thing he does is, well, Laban goes and tries to, uh, Laman tries to go to Laban and to convince him to give up the brass plates. And Laban had nothing for it. So they come back and they're like, what are we going to do? And Nephi decides, hey, we're going to take our property and we're going to offer to buy the brass plates. So they took all their property and they went to Laban and they offered to exchange property for the brass plates. Now, the scriptures say that Laban coveted the property and that he sent men after Nephi and his brothers to kill them in order to take their property. So there we have a double capital offense. Not only was he trying to steal their livelihood and their inheritance, which is capital offense number one, he was trying to do so by the sword. And had he been able to succeed, he would have murdered them. So not only was it an attempted murder, it was an attempted murder twice because he's stealing their property as well. And so now, when you come to Nephi, Nephi goes into the city. Nephi is being led by the Spirit, doesn't know what he's supposed to do. Verse 6 of chapter 4 says, And I was led by the Spirit, not knowing beforehand the things which I should do. Nephi didn't know what was going on. When he finds Laban, the very first thing he does is pull out his sword. Now, that's not a normal thing you would do if you find someone who's drunk. You don't pull out their sword and check their sword. But if you have someone who's been trying to kill you, 
the very first thing you do is you do disarm them. Now, he looks at his sword, and then the spirit says, kill him. And it's really important to understand what Nephi says here. Nephi says, And I said in my heart, Never at any time have I shed the blood of man, and I shrunk and would that I might not slay him. Nephi does not say, Never have I shed innocent blood. He says, Never have I shed any blood, the guilty or the innocent. Then it's important to understand that because Nephi is not trying to absolve himself and saying that Laban is innocent and he doesn't have the right to die. Nephi is saying, hey, just because I have the right to kill him doesn't mean I want to. I've never killed anyone and I don't want to kill somebody. Now, in the next verse, the spirit then goes ahead and it outlines why. It says, and the spirit said unto me again, behold, the Lord has delivered him into your hand. Yea, and I also knew that he had sought to take away my life. Strike number one, capital offense. Yea, and he would not hearken to the commandments of the Lord. Strike number two. Yea, and he also had taken away our property. Now, not only is this the justification for killing Laban, this is one of the greatest testaments that the Book of Mormon is true. Because in 1820, someone stealing your property wasn't a capital offense. So why would Joseph Smith, if he was making up the Book of Mormon, use this as justification to kill someone? Because nobody in New England reading this story would associate, he stole my property, I'm going to kill him. They would say that's an outlandish claim. That's an outlandish logic. That doesn't make sense. But Joseph Smith didn't write the Book of Mormon. Nephi wrote the Book of Mormon. Nephi wrote the Book of Mormon within his cultural context. Joseph Smith translated that. This is one of those points that is saying, this is true. This is authentic. Joseph Smith wouldn't have known this. Most people today don't even know this. That when you take someone's property, it is a capital offense under the Mosaic Law. And the next verse, verse 12, says, And it came to pass, the Spirit said unto me again, Slay him, for the Lord has delivered him into your hands. And so now Nephi is struggling. The Spirit is saying, You are justified under the law given by God to Moses to kill him. You are justified to execute him. He has committed a capital offense, not just against you, but against your family. Not just has he done these bad things to you, but he's disobedient to God as a whole. He's giving Nephi a lot of reasons why he should exercise his legal right to execute Laban for his sins and his crimes. Nephi still doesn't want to do it. Nephi's justified, but he doesn't want to kill Laban. Now, in verse 13 is when the Lord finally gives Nephi the reason that Nephi realizes, oh, you know, I will exercise my legal right, and I will execute him. It says, And the Lord slayeth the wicked to bring forth righteous purposes. It is better that one man should perish than a nation should dwindle and perish in unbelief. And now when I, Nephi, heard these words, I remembered the words which the Lord spake unto me in the wilderness, saying, Inasmuch as thy seed shall keep my commandments, they shall prosper in the land of promise. And, uh, yea, and I also thought that they could not keep the commandments, of the Lord, according to the law of Moses, save they should have the law. And I also knew that the law was engraven upon the plates of brass. And again, I knew that the Lord had delivered Laban into my hands for this cause, that I might obtain the records according to the commandments. So Nephi now realizes, not only do I have the legal right, twice, not only has, is Laban going to do bad things if I don't kill him, it is going to cost me and my seed, and my children and my grandchildren, their salvation. And so Nephi doesn't kill Laban because he had the right to. Nephi doesn't kill Laban because Laban is a bad dude. Nephi finally decided to kill Laban because those justifications were there, but also because he realized the cost of not killing him. So not only was he justified legally, morally, he was also justified spiritually. Therefore I did obey the voice of the Spirit, and I took Laban by the hair of his head, and I smote off his head with his own sword. That is an execution. That is not murdering somebody. That's not killing somebody. That is executing somebody according to your legal right. That is taking upon yourself the avenger of blood, the person who's been wronged. Laban had committed capital offenses against Nephi and his family. And in verse 18 of chapter 4, Nephi extracts his right as the legal victim of attempted murder in executing the offender of that crime. So, 
not only should Nephi killing Laban not be an issue, Nephi killing Laban should actually be a huge testimony builder because there is not a chance that Joseph Smith knew this much Hebrew tradition and this much Hebrew culture and law and doctrine. This is ridiculous to assume or to claim that Joseph Smith knew this in the first place. And so I find it ironic that one of the strongest testimonies of the Book of Mormon, Satan turns around and tries to use to break people's testimonies. So, the book is true. The Book of Mormon is real. Joseph Smith is a prophet of God. Nephi did not break the commandments. Not only would his nation have perished and dwindled in unbelief, our nation would have dwindled and perished in unbelief if it wasn't for the coming forth of the Book of Mormon. I bear my testimony. I know these things are true. The church is true. President Nilsson is a prophet of God. There is no anti that doesn't have a valid answer. And sometimes a valid answer is relying on the answers you've already received. But like this right here, there are simple explanations to a lot of them. That's my testimony. The name is Christ. Amen.